Some people have said he was the greatest Asian since the Buddha. Some have called him the most illustrious leader of men who ever lived. Some called him a rogue, a charlatan, a saint, or an enemy. For a generation, he held in his hands the destiny of 300 million human beings. He was, above all things, an enigma. The whole world knew him, and nobody knew him. into which Gandhi was born in 1869 was incalculably vast and brooding. An enormous, shapeless, and almost unmanageable mass of the human race, embalmed in thousands of years of intricate, unchangeable tradition. A society of ageless anomalies and undefined ambitions, dominated by religions of infinitely complex demands. A society so ingrown that it could contemplate almost anything except the future. Yet there was one coherent thing in it, the Raj, the empire of India, the jewel in the imperial crown. British dominion over India was almost a law of nature, producing its own sort of certainties, its own elaborate hierarchy, its own benefits and tyrannies. The huge, solid, suburban structure of the exotic Anglo-Saxon, of viceregal pomp and circumstance, of puppet princes, of supervising Saabs, unquestionably ruled by Britain, with Britain's strange mixture of the benign and the intolerable. Something so splendid, so settled and secure, that to change it would surely need an act of God. There were, however, too many gods involved. There had, therefore, to be a man. One man out of 300 millions. He was there somewhere. For all this enormous inevitability, all this certain power was to be changed by one very curious and insignificant little man. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi from Gujarat, of the trader's caste member of the inner temple, barrister at law. The small man built of tremendous opposites, determined to drive India into the future with the weapons of the past. He chose as his instrument, not the sword, but something far simpler, something that was to be the political emblem of austerity, the spinning wheel, the symbol of simplicity, of self-sufficiency. This wasn't idly chosen. This was challenging the West by denying all Western values. This was both dedicated and ingenious. Gandhi knew that no amount of homespun could overcome the product of the Lancashire mills, but it dramatized the notion of patriotism. It was a brilliant political idea. Soon, the wheel became the status symbol of Indianism. The homespun had a cloth, the uniform of the revolution the most shrewd and inspired campaign of naivety in the history of political war. And Gandhi's following grew. The enormous, baffled, groping mass of India began at last to stir, to see the star in the sky. An odd-looking star, to be sure, but it said what nobody had effectively said before. Perhaps a man had some sort of a right to be his own master even in India. There had been nationalist movements before, 
but they'd been shapeless, meaningless, lacking in inspiration. It was left to this little lawyer from Gujarat and the inner temple to provide that inspiration. Gandhi's next symbol was infinitely greater and more potent because it found its roots in religion. India has so many. It was chance that it started with the Sikhs. In the 20s, with elaborate ceremony, Gandhi opened the first all India civil disobedience. And a word was born that was perhaps Gandhi's biggest contribution to language, Satyagraha. It meant, vaguely, the force of righteousness. It came to mean non-cooperation, passive resistance. Here, at last, was Indian nationalism's secret weapon. Troops who could handle a shrilling, violent, armed mob had a different problem with men who offered neither words nor resistance, who raised no hand, who allowed violence to be done to them without complaint, who accepted injury or death without a cry and were silently replaced by more. It's fair to say that only Gandhi could have imposed the bitter disciplines of Satyagraha on a fiercely resentful people. It meant being hurt, never retaliating, being attacked and answering nothing, being humiliated without protest. It meant relying on the inability of human officials to continue forever to assault the uncomplaining. But it worked. He had developed this painfully exacting technique of resistance during his 20 years in South Africa but it was not a weapon to use against the Boers. Now he was dealing with the British, who were, it was said, different, who found it harder to hurt the helpless and persecute those who asked for peace. It took a generation to find out. Resistance spread over the country, into the cities through the teeming, overcrowded streets of British India, where men lived on a shilling a day and sometimes wondered why. To keep this flickering, unformed sense of purpose within the bounds of non-violence was the task Gandhi set upon himself. Over and over again he failed. All the history of revolution shows that it's easy to inflame people to attack, immensely difficult to curb them into the disciplines of dignity. Gandhi was dealing with mortal men. That was his trouble all his life. Gandhi went to prison. Many times he was to go to prison, in many places. In the years to come, that scrupulous personal honesty of which he could never rid himself, though he often tried, forced him to admit that he could even enjoy jail. He told me once that it punctuated a monstrously busy life with wonderful islands of privacy. He wrote oceans of literature in jail, while outside his followers clamoured for his release. Moreover, it became obvious that he could get out of prison almost whenever he wanted to. He had the famous weapon of the fast. Fasting was a political instrument, as much as prayer or polemics, or indeed, passive resistance. The British did not want to risk Gandhi dying on their hands. But Gandhi, who was an Asian, could fast unto death as a perfectly normal attitude of political persuasion. Almost until his dying day, he used self-sacrifice as the key to open locked hearts and unchangeable intentions, knowing that outside the prison, the country demanded his release. The time was to come when, if Gandhi fasted, the world began to hold its breath. When he came out of jail, Gandhi was now to be unchallenged leader of the nationalist movement. By now, this strange little man, the simple and subtle, meek and mighty, honest and devious, was himself the single prophet of Swaraj, independence.
a new facet to rebellion, the classic salt march to Dundee. Salt was a government monopoly. To tax a gift of nature was brutally hard on the poor. Gandhi, choosing, as always, the elementary symbol for the complex issue, led his march to the source of salt, the ocean. Steadily, on foot, he crossed the immense country. Volunteers fell in. Very soon, India was alight from Karachi to Bengal. Gandhi knew what he was doing when he made his symbol from salt. Every day, the procession grew. Every sundown, they listened, while Gandhi became prophet and politician and evoked the many names of God in the surface of nationalism. For Gandhi, the prayer meeting was both pulpit and platform. Thus, it was to be all his life. 24 days later, Gandhi was to reach the sea, the source of salt, as he said, the birthright of every man. He lifted a handful of brine to his lips. All India applauded, and the tax remained. But from that moment onwards, Gandhi was no longer a little local savior, an inconsiderable insurgent in a petty cause. From then on, Gandhi began to move into history. By the 1930s, Gandhi had moved from oblivion into importance, from obscurity to the leadership of 300 million people. He was still a quaint little man, but the world was beating on his door. He may have looked unimpressive, and deliberately so, but never was he called ridiculous. He was already incomparably the most important man in Asia. International politics were taking notice. The Western world was moving in. If England uh, grants your demands, Mr. Gandhi, uh, do you intend to have complete prohibition in the new Indian state? Oh, yes. Absolute prohibition? Absolutely. And do you intend also, if India wins its independence, to abolish child marriages? I should very much like to, even before. Even before that time. Mm -hmm. And do you uh, expect to exterminate the present caste system, which makes practical outcasts of India's so-called 60 millions of untouchables. You have decided me. In the new Indian state, as you uh, visualize it, Mr. Gandhi, do you expect to have complete communal and social harmony between the Muslims and Hindus? I should be severely disappointed if it was otherwise. The next step was inevitable. Britain had to send for him. The Mahatma, as by now he was, the holy leader, went to London for the round table conference which was to thrash out some sort of constitution for an Indian nation. London smiled a little at the bizarre figure in the dhoti and the tin spectacles, the essence of the unsophisticated, who could break up any committee by squatting down to pray halfway through if it were time for prayer or for a diversion. He insisted, characteristically, on living in the Kingsley Hall settlement in Bow, among the poor of the East End, for they, as he said, are the only ones I need. Nevertheless, he spoke at Eton and Oxford and Cambridge and Downing Street and the House of Commons. He met everyone from Lloyd George to Bernard Shaw to the Pearly Kings to the King of England. Winston Churchill refused to see him. Somebody asked Gandhi if he'd felt sufficiently dressed for his talk with the King Emperor. The king, said Gandhi, had enough on for both of us. These were changed days from the 1890s when the poor Hindu student from Gujarat had kept terms at the temple, striving to assimilate, battling to understand, and even in desperation, buying a bowler hat and taking lessons in the two-step. But he never did assimilate. 
Gandhi remained all his student days, the Indian from Gujarat, at odds with all the values of the West. And in that, he was never to change. And England adored him, as it adores all eccentrics. That is, the people did. The government most certainly didn't. And the conference, like all the others, came to dust. The Constitution offered India something, but not what Gandhi wanted. My speeches at the Round Table Conference have all officially reported. Call that as you like. It is complete independence that we want. He went home by way of France, Switzerland, Italy. The Pope wouldn't see him, but Mussolini did. It was a curious interlude. The politics of Mr. Gandhi were one track. He wanted one thing, Indian independence, and he was prepared to argue this wherever he happened to be and whoever would listen to him. Whether they took him seriously or not, as a rule, they didn't. Gandhi was England's problem. The Italy of Mussolini was only too pleased to welcome anyone capable of embarrassing the British Empire. Who could compress the life and character of Gandhi into a handful of words? He did his best himself. No man ever communed so frankly and publicly with himself, so spiritually, for wholly matter-of-fact ends. The ends were politics. Everything in life was politics. The vegetarianism, the rigidly ascetic life, the insistence on third-class travel, even though it had to be, naturally, a special train. Nobody insisted more sternly on living among the poor even though the sweeper's colonies in which he took his lodging had to be vastly modified. I was once told by Mrs. Sarajini Naidu, that great political poetess, ah, if the Mahatma only knew what it cost us for him to live the simple life. Everything was politics for this simple, complicated, ordinary and extraordinary man. And politics equaled faith plus expediency. At the dock to greet Gandhi home was his wife, the patient, innocent Kasturbai, who could never either read nor write, yet was such a potent influence on Gandhi's strange and troubled sexual torments. For he, who so bitterly denounced the archaic Hindu institution of child marriage, had himself been married at 13. All his life this haunted the Mahatma. The one thing that was bad politics was sex. The huge demonstrations of his political life were public enough. The little man had only to show his person, but half India was at his heels, having what they called darshan of him, to breathe his air, absorbing his presence. All this was the fairly commonplace attitude of a politician, which Gandhi was. But almost as public did he himself make the usually secret dilemma of his sex, with which he never really came to terms. Sex could be a wasteful, even sinful aberration. Having once, he publicly said, indulged in it too wantonly, some awful sense of rejection came over him. And thus he drove Kasturbai from his bed and proclaimed his unhappy victory in the perpetual attendance of his granddaughters and goddaughters who watched him thenceforth day and night. India's frustrations grew worse and so did fear. The shutters went up. Gandhi called for a fiery ordeal without malice or hatred, more civil disobedience. India was on the brink, and everyone knew it. The government struck back with repressions more drastic, as Winston Churchill put it, than anything imposed since the mutiny. Gandhi was again arrested. Congress was banned and sequestrated. The press was controlled. Collective fines were imposed. Passive resistance was not a simple code to follow, nor was it always followed. But Gandhi designed it to render government impossible by withdrawing the consent of the governed. The alternative was civil war, which India could never win. But by now, the outside world had even greater troubles. History was rushing on, forgetful of India. Suddenly, the explosion came. 
the Second World War, threatening India with invasion. Gandhi, who had supported the First War, bitterly opposed this one. We do not seek our independence out of Britain's ruin, said Gandhi, but we oppose this war. But Gandhi was in jail. Events were now out of his hands. Of course, these arguments were meaningless. The Indian army moved. Winston Churchill told the House of Commons that in the face of the Japanese advance, India must be rallied to her own defense. And to that end, a member of the war cabinet would go out to Delhi and lay Britain's case before the Indians. The first of the interminable debates on the soil of India began. There was plenty of goodwill on a personal level, both with Sir Stafford Cripps and with Jawaharlal Nehru, by now the other dominating personality of the freedom movement. But the negotiations never stood a chance. Behind the good intentions of Sir Stafford Cripps lay the implacable opposition of Winston Churchill. This was British India. How could India ever go? It was a stalling operation, and Gandhi, out of jail after ten years, knew it, and Cripps knew it. It was part of the twenty-year-old game of quibbles and evasions and the sterile, worn-out arguments of the irreconcilable, and it ended like the rest. The thing that had cursed and bedeviled every negotiation and every compromise grew worse. The fact that India was still two nations, Hindu and Muslim. And by now, the tremendous task of Gandhi was twofold. He'd not only to free India, but unite her. And the man who personified political Islam grew stronger. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, leader of India's 90 billion minority, the Mohammedan absolutist who dressed in impeccable European clothes, who stood for everything that Gandhi opposed, who fought for an independent Muslim Pakistan with such intractable zeal that he was known as the man with a difficulty for every solution. This, we said at the time, was the classic instance of the irresistible force and the immovable object. Gandhi and Jinnah were the parting of the ways. From now on, it was clearly going to be hard. Peace, said Mahatma Gandhi. All gods are good and all men are brothers. A small voice in a great chasm. He would descend on India here and there in his usual blaze of secrecy and distill his strange synthesis of politics and prayer. The occasion was almost hypnotic. Those who believed were overcome. I, who believed in nothing, could be equally taken over by this curious domination. Then the British cabinet mission came to India and began arguing an epoch to an end. What had begun in blood and conquest was ending in wrangling, casuistry and special pleading from all the faiths and factions of the land. India, litigious to the last, was indeed finding freedom the hard way. The hard and inescapable fact that confronted Gandhi now was that India was not a nation, but a mosaic of nations, each with their own ambitions and anxieties, each aching with doubts as to the future of their own identities. Everyone determined that whoever must lose or compromise on the independence deal, it should not be them. Throughout this mess of contention, Gandhi continued to hold his prayer meetings, publicly serene, privately uncertain, impatient and angry, addressing the people with a sort of mounting desperation.
But even here, among the maze of uncertainties and suspicions, there was a kind of dignity. It had taken many years, but at last Gandhi had persuaded the British to realize, with the sense of history that always supervenes, however late, that the time had come to go. But there was much painful work still to be done. With the ominous inevitability of partition, the tension grew. The nearer the day of liberation loomed, the darker seemed to be the prospect of an easy birth. Every minority feared its neighbor. Great populations began to panic, to get on the move. The point had been reached from which no one could budge. Something had to be done about India, and soon. Gandhi knew this. Gandhi foresaw it all. He tried to explain. All over the gigantic spaces of India, they followed the argument with difficulty, yet somehow knowing that their future at least was assured, that he who had always gone hungry would continue to go hungry, that he who pulled the loads would still pull the loads, that whoever was at the top among these contending ranks, he at least would still be at the bottom. Blessed are the lowly and uncaring, the ignorant and the forgotten, for of such is the Republic of Heaven. Britain had sent out Lord Mountbatten to be the last of the viceroys, to bring to an end the Indian chapter, which had in it so much of wrong and folly, and not a little of decency and justice. It took, perhaps, a tougher honesty and a braver skill to liquidate an empire than ever it did to win it. And there it was at last, the 15th of August, 1947, Independence for India, the culmination of all the pain and striving that had gone before, all the waste and love and hate and contest, all gone at last. But Gandhi boycotted the celebrations. He said, I deceived myself into the belief that people were wedded to non-violence. He was hurt, disappointed and angry. The parting was almost emotional. For years, the British soldiers had seen the signs on the walls. Quit India. And how often had they chalked up the inevitable response. I wish to God I could. Now, the day had come. Mountbatten saw them off from the port of Bombay. The era was ended. And then, all hell broke loose for a time. The surgery was over. India and Pakistan were amputated, one from the other. The operation had been an emergency one, and sepsis had followed instantly. A terrible inflammation of vengeance and destruction around the line of the wound. Hindus and Muslims alike, poor victims, furious at the vivisection of the land, killed and were killed, scattering along the dusty streets the stinking residue of freedom, which is death. What could Gandhi do? He was a man of patriotism and of peace, and suddenly they seemed incompatible. This was a wretched conclusion to a splendid and resounding task. What he could do, he did. For of Gandhi, it must be said, he had no fear of men because he loved them. Sometimes, maybe, too much. But he continued to protest and remonstrate, though now he had nothing to offer them but brotherhood, and nobody seemed to want that. All they wanted now was something to eat and to drink and the hope of safety. Just that time, he said to me, I think I'm a spent bullet. It was an awful thing to hear, because he was not. He had only one answer to this awful, brother-hating conflict that had overwhelmed his people. What he had done to overcome the British, he could do to overcome the Indians. He fasted. It was his inevitable act of faith, his enduring resource when all else failed. And it brought the inescapable wave of emotion. 
Bapuji was immolating himself again. Bapuji, the father figure, must be preserved. Once again, all the concentration of Indian emotion was focused on Gandhi, as he knew it must be. And once again, he spared himself and returned from the glass cage of isolation where he was so potent to the outer world, where, alas, he was not. All Gandhi was paradox. He hated capitalism, yet lived half his time in the home of Birla, India's biggest industrial boss. And there he was to die, holding, as he always did at sunset, one of his meetings of political prayer. On the 30th of January, 1948, a crazy Hindu, one of his own faith, walked up to Gandhi and shot him dead before a thousand eyes. At his funeral, when he was taken to the burning ghat by the Jumna River, India went mad. I know I was among that fantastic multitude who saw the final irony that Gandhi, the pacifist, the idolater of peace, the inventor of non-violence, whose supreme and overriding tenet of faith was that no man should lift his hand against another, would be carried to the bonfire on an army gun carriage with an escort of soldiers. Gandhi had lived to liberate India. He died because the fanatical fringe of Hinduism held him guilty of betraying India by condoning her division. Thus, he both lived and died for the millions who were to reap what he had sown. For now, India was without Gandhi, a nation on her own. I do dimly perceive that whilst everything around me is ever changing, ever dying, there is underlying all that change a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God. I see it as purely benevolent, for I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. <laughs> 